Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Elucidating the Composition of CRISPR-Cas12 F1 Complexes Using Mass Photometry. I am Julie Abing of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Refine. To learn more, visit refine.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time, as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit to any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Selgar Henkel Heineke, PhD student at the University of Leipzig. Selgar, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for joining this webinar today. I am uh, Serga Hengel Heinecke. I'm at the Deba Peter Debye Institute for Soft Metaphysics at the University of Leipzig in the group of Ralph Seidel. And I will talk today about elucidating the composition of uh, CRISPR Cas12 F1 complexes with uh, or by using mass photometry. So, CRISPR Cas uh, effector complexes, so what are they? They are adaptive immune systems against invading plasmids or viruses. So uh, protein or more or less, they form a ruinuclein complex uh, with the RNA, which is here in light blue. And we have the protein here. So they form, first of all, a complex. This complex can bind by uh, the by a base pairing uh, to DNA with the RNA. And then we have here the, the target sequence. And this um, spacer or target sequence can be programmed uh, to target specific DNA sequences via this CRISPR or CRRNA or this or a gRNA guide RNA. And therefore, it's a powerful tool uh, for genome editing. So in nature, there are a lot of uh, CRISPR systems and they are very diverse. I just uh, picked here three more or less the, the most famous ones. So first of all, we have the Cas9 here and the Cas12A, which are, as you see here, monomeric. So the protein complex itself is, is monomeric. And of course, they then form a bigger complex, but it's, it's more or less monomeric. And uh, we can have also like people uh, cascade, uh, which is a multimeric protein uh, or has multimeric uh, domain structure here. And also for nuclease activity, it has to recruit another protein, the Cas3. And as we see here that the complex st uh, stoichiometry is diverging. And for further research, we picked then the Cas12 family itself to look at it, first of all, a bit more in detail. And uh, so therefore we looked, uh, or as you see here already, uh, we have a very diverse family uh, from, I just picked here this five uh, ones, so that you have also, we have from A to E and so on, they, this, there's also B, C and so on and so on. Like, so it's a big family. Uh, you see also they are very diverse in their size of the protein, of the RNA, what they are targeting. But what is what I all have in common is that they have a one-to-one stoichiometry -one, um, if you look at the protein RNA ratio. And when you look a bit more uh, into genome editing, you have a need for small proteins because they can easier or more easily uh, transported into the nucleus. And so in that sense here, when you look at Cas12F, you have, uh, it's, it's the smallest representative within this uh, family. Um, but the stoichiometry is still unknown or was still unknown at that time. And we then used mass photometry in that sense as a fast method to obtain this composition. For, the, for those of you who uh, just heard of, of mass photometry, um, I will quickly explain how it works. So we have uh, incident light, which gets the, uh, into, which is shined into the sample or onto the sample here. And then we have reflected light from the bare glass surface, and we have scattered light from the biomolecules. And um, this reflected and scattered light then interfere with each other. And this interference pattern is then proportional to the size of uh, the biomolecule. 
And there's one more thing you have to, to do before calibrating the system. Um, no, you have to calibrate the system before you really get uh, to measure the whole thing. So what you normally measure is you cannot measure molecular masses, of course. You measure a ratiometric contrast. This ratiometric contrast uh, decreases linearly with increasing mass. And in that sense, here we used a multimerizing protein um, as a calibration standard. And um, then we can use a very simple linear fit to obtain the, uh, from the ratiometric contrast, the molecular masses. What we should have, or what we should keep in mind for the rest of the talk already is that nucleic acids have a slightly lower uh, molecular mass. The uh, calibration is done with the protein standard. So this means, uh, for example, for DNA, um, it appears only in, in such a uh, spectrum with only about 80% of the expected or calculated mass um, uh, you, you would uh, you, you calculate it. So what uh, have we done before we uh, actually get to the cas 2 ff uh, Systems, we used a known complex or um, system here from uh, cas 2 ffa from acetylbacillus sulfur oxidants and so we have here a big size protein, one, over 1,000 amino acids. Um, it has a, a calculated or expected mass of 151 kilodalton. And when we measured the protein alone, we got um, an ACE peak around 150 kilodalton. And it has a very small CRISPR RNA uh, in comparison to the protein size. And um, of course, the stoichiometry was known from cryogen data. Um, so you see here that the the RNA is buried inside this very large protein complex or protein itself. And um, so when we then mixed the protein with the CRISPR RNA, we had an expected mass of 166 kilodalton. We measured 167 kilodalton, which gave us nicely this, uh, the group, uh, this one to one ratio, which we uh, were expecting as well. And then we thought, okay, we go further with this, and um, we look at the mass binary uh, of the binary complex of Casper F1 from Centrophomonas palmitatica, and there we measured also the protein itself uh, with an expected mass of 57 kilodalton, and we got um, a measured mass of 59 kilodalton, which was in the expected or in the um, yeah in the range of, of the whole system. And um, so everything was fine. But when we measured then the binary complex, we expected, as before, a one to one ratio. So we were expecting something around 125 kilodalton as a main peak. But we got always a main peak around 180 kilodalton. So what we could see is that sense we cannot explain the stoichiometry via a very simple one-to-one -one ratio. And uh, so we then went one step further. We thought, okay, we have to measure the RNA mass directly. <clears throat> In that sense, there was the next big, um, yeah, a big, big, big step in that sense. Uh, so we measured the RNA alone. And we got this. So why do we get such a not nicely shaped spectrum? Spectrum, um, yeah. So the, the as you know, uh, um, the glass surface is negatively charged, and therefore the protein adsorption is is preferred. And if we use then nucleic acids, we get only a low number of events. So we therefore have to positively charge the surface. Then nucleic adsor acid adsorption becomes uh, or is then preferred. And we get a high number of events. And as you see here, it's these, this and this are uh, two spectrums of the same RNA. But here we 
barely got any counts and here we have a lot of counts just from the y-axis already and we see here that we have a um, mass of 62 kilodalton and a expected mass of eight, uh, 68 kilodalton so here again we see that nucleic acids um, have a slightly lower uh, or show a lower or appear with a lower ma um, mass than expected um, but also RNA and DNA uh, differ a bit from each other. With this knowledge, we then went again to assemble the puzzle in that sense. So we had the measurement of the protein itself. We then had the measurement of the RNA and we could uh, dive into the effector complex again with all our informations. And that time we assumed a two to one ratio for the um, from protein to RNA. And we got this um, a few, one or two months before we uh, could, uh, or when we were still in this process, there was a publication also on this uh, stoichiometries or on the structure of these complexes. And they could show as well uh, that we have two proteins here and one RNA in that sense. So we could nicely get the same information with mass photometry. And we went then one step further. We took our binary complex and mixed it with DNA to look if this binary complex, this two to one ratio in that sense, is also the active form of um, uh, which is then targeting DNA. So we took a big P or a piece of DNA with 250 kilodalton. This is calculated. We measured it um, on a positively charged surface, and we got 205 kilodalton uh, measured. And when we took and when we mixed this all together, we expected a peak uh, around 390 kilodalton. And what we see here is a peak at 390 kilodalton for a two to one to one ratio for the ternary complex. Um, consisting of protein, RNA, and DNA, which was also a show or just recent published in that sense in the same publication where they also showed the uh, complex, the ternary structure of the, uh, structure of the ternary complex. And this was all done for central for monas palmitatica in that sense. We um, had more. <laughs> and so we played the same game for uh, the cusp of F1 complex of acetobacillus sulfooxidans. And um, I will not go too much into detail with the numbers this time, but we again measured the protein itself, the RNA itself, and we nicely got again the, for the binary complex, the two to one ratio in that sense. And um, we went further on again, looking if the binary complex is also targeting DNA in that sense. And for one, one note, note again, we have uh, from the calculated mass and the appeared mass, so again, about 20% um, less. And when we look at the ternary complex, we again expected a two to one to one ratio in that sense. And here we got again a, a, a peak around this position. And again, a two, two, so we could resolve this two to one to one ratio with mass photometry. We had one last um, binary complex um, investigated uh, from this time from an uncultured archaeon. And there again, we measured the protein itself with the RNA, and we could resolve again this binary complex with a two to one ratio. And um, in that sense, it's, it was very nice. And then in the end, if you have all the information how you can measure this, it was very easy and quickly done. Um, a last example of how to um, get into the composition of such um, complexes, but this time with a different, uh, with a slightly different um, uh, situation. We got from our collaborators from Vilnius this transposase B, which has a um, mass of 46 kilodalton. 
and um, the problem was that it assembles with the RNA during gene expression. So there was no information uh, on about how big the complex itself was. Um, we had expected um, or calculated mass of the protein itself, but we want, but our collaborators wanted also to know what is the the complex composition. And um, so a RNA measurement was not possible, and also of course there was no there was no possibility to measure the protein itself. And uh, all our, our collaborators, uh, in that sense, later you can measure uh, read this also in their publication in Nature. Um, so what I did then to to really get into the um, to reveal this. Uh, composition, I looked at the desorption events. So what I focused so far in this um, whole talk was about um, the adsorption events, which appear with a positive or with a normal mass as, as you know it. The desorption events due to mathematical uh, correct or however you want to call this, it's, it's just something mathematical that there is their negative sign. So <clears throat> we can here we see what is going away from the surface. And in that sense, since we use um, a normal glass surface and not a, a, a um, coated surface, we can look what is going away from the surface as well as what is landing on the surface. And normally what is going away from the surface, if you have such a mixture, are the nucleic acids, not the, the protein stays there. So we can obtain even more or in one measurement, you can obtain the information of the um, nucleic acid, more or less, without uh, that, without having to measure the uh, nucleic acid itself. And in that sense, I looked at this negative or at this desorption events, and we could then resolve this because we see here, okay, they appear with um, 42 kilodalton. And, um, and when we then take into account that they normally have a slightly um, lower num um, mass than calculated, we go into something perhaps 50 or 49 kilodalton. And then this whole thing here revealed a one-to-one -one ratio. So to summarize my talk, um, you have to keep some things in mind if you want to resolve such uh, complexes with DNA, RNA, and, and protein, of course. So it's such ternary or binary complexes whatsoever. When you calibrate and use protein think about think or at, at any time or however you want to you, however you calibrate the whole system that only that they appear with slightly different masses so in my case here dna appears with about 80 percent of the calculated mass and pro and rna with about 95 percent of the expected or calculated mass to really measure um, nucleate acids and to increase the event number and the resolution, you should uh, coat your surface with polylysine before a measurement. And then you can, um, yeah, such stoichiometries can be resolved of binary and ternary complexes. And you can also, you, you can you do it like this or as I showed you one slide before with the desorption events as well, but this you can ask me um, again later on. And I have to say, or more or less that mass photometry in that sense is a very fast method to unravel such protein, DNA, RNA interactions. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to thank uh, Refine for the opportunity to speak to you and to give this webinar in that sense. And furthermore, I would like to thank our collaborators from Vilnius 
and of course uh, my group, the Molecular Biophysics Group in Leipzig of Ralf Seidel um, for the opportunity and uh, the discussions about this whole uh, topic here. And yeah, I'm done. And please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you, so informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, how did you ensure that the binary complex composition is not the opposite, such as two RNA molecules and one protein? Um, yeah. Uh, how do we, do we do that? So to do this, we um, employed measurements using more so titrations in that sense. So we um, I or I titrated then uh, RNA um, more RNA instead of more protein, and in that sense, I saw the same um, composition or the same. The complexes itself looked the same and the, the the spectra looked the same as if i titrated more and more protein so in that sense we saw that um, um that the the complex was the same and um, on the other side when looking at uh, the desorption events we saw with uh, more rna we saw that we got a lot more um yeah, desorb desorbing uh, molecules uh, than using um, the <clears throat> uh, with the protein we didn't see any desorbing events. So in that sense, we we solved this by titrating um, the the protein with uh, more RNA. more questions so, then, our, our second question oh. is um how can unbinding events be used to obtain masses of dna or rna uh, can be used. Uh, yeah so i see i think in that sense it's um yeah so i will go to this slide one more time um sorry yeah um okay Oh, um, in that sense, to obtain the, uh, I have to look at the question one more time. Uh, how can I find the events? I am so in, so, I mean, it's, it's very simple in that sense, this, uh, uh, what you see here, which is encircled in red. Um, so these unbinding events, if you have, um, a non-coded surface and, um, use then a mixture with protein and nucleic acids you will always get these um uh, these these high uh, counts of of desorbing events and uh, here you can use um this i mean it's negative but this is just something mathematical it's nothing real this negative thing so in that sense uh yeah this can be used to to obtain these uh, negative or the masses, not negative masses, but the masses of, of uh, nucleic acid in the sense of, uh, and then to obtain uh, the composition as well. Alrighty, we have another question that asks, the negative values in this case of the R of the mm. TNPB complex would imply that the RNA is falling out of the complex? Um, I think, yes, um, this we didn't, uh also we went not too far into this um detail i uh in that sense uh, i just got the 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 samples from from our collaborators from vilnius and um yeah i think i mean normally um there will always be some equilibrium uh having of course um protein and 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 rna or nucleic acid uh just by themselves and and as a complex and i think in that sense 
you really just see um yeah the desorbing of of uh in that sense since you you i mean the the protein complex with the rna then is can be seen as some kind of uh coating and then we see that the in that in that sense some some of the rna can bind to the to to this site and then desorbs again and i think so in that sense we see just free nucleic acids and and i think i don't think that there is some kind of uh, decomposition of the of the tnvp complex in that sense so it's more like yeah it's 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 like you see the free the free rna which is not in a in a complex just uh, binding and desorbing again and in that sense it's also very small so you would not see it um or or i mean it's it's just like i i told you before in the um in the talk that um they are not binding very, very well to the surface and so this desorbing is is more seen than than the the real binding so I, I think I, I talked a bit too much about this, but I hope that uh, I, I could give you an answer for this. <laughs> Wonderful. And then uh, we have another question that asks, from my understanding, mass photometry is measuring the size of the particle and then using the density of the particle to calculate the mass. Can this method use... Uh, can this method used to measure the size only? Can we use it to measure other nanoparticles like lipid or polyplex? Ooh, good. Um, I have to read the question one more time. Um, what I can say is that we tried also in our group to measure DNA origami um, uh, molecules and to measure it this didn't work so well um but i'm not 100 percent sure if they got it to work but because i'm i'm in my in my group i'm on the on the protein uh, dna or in the crispr field so this i cannot tell you um but to measure the size yeah you can measure the sizes only of course i mean in that sense but for other nanoparticles i think this you should ask the the team of refine um they are more into this mm. yeah all righty and but, wonderful yeah. we have another question um could you explain again how you reach the conclusion that the ratio is one to one um yeah of course i i think this is again regarding this tnpb so um so the conclusion well, or how did i get to this conclusion so i measured first uh or i measured the complex which was assembled already and i had uh, this was the only information i got and then i measured the 96 kilodalton and the next step then was to look at the desorption events which are here encircled in red and um, from that and then this is the this is then the clear size of the rna in this uh, solution or in this complex because this is protein doesn't there there would be only i don't know a few one up to i don't know five to ten um events but not I, I think this was like a few hundred like 700 800 events or something so you would clearly see a difference if this was only protein or um or something which is i mean no, only protein and um in that sense so this is clearly the nucleic acid in that in this case here rna and if you then compare the size of the rna to the size of the complex um and we knew that the 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 mass of the um, TNPB was uh, 46 kilodalton. We could, or we assumed from that, uh, that uh, the whole um, or that the ratio of this complex uh, is one to one. I hope this is um, uh, now answered. 
Yes, and then we have another question that says, um, why can you not see desorbing of the whole complex at once? Um, I mean, you see, <coughs> sorry, uh, you see some, I will just go perhaps previous. Yeah, yeah so now uh, it's not in circle. I mean, you see here at, at the 100 also and, and a bit lower, so at the negative side, um, you see also some events, what I told you so far. So these, there are some minor uh, desorbing events, of course, of the whole um, complex itself. Um, I think, but I'm not 100% sure, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, she also did measurements with a coated um, surface. Um, a measuring protein DNA complexes. And I think there she could see some or more desorbing events of, of such a um, protein DNA um, complex. But uh, for me, this was not, not the, this was not the, the question in this experiment, but you, you will, or you, you would see um, the, the complex itself if you would uh, use a um, coated uh, slide with uh, polylysine in that sense. Alrighty, and then for gRNA, can we use nucleic acid calibrants instead of protein calibrants? Will this yield more accurate mass values? Yes, of yes. This if you if you if you're just interested in measuring gRNA and not in uh, measuring uh, complex or, or complexes with different uh, composition, then you can always use um, uh, a calibrant, so just like a nucleic acid. Or if you even have it, you could use um, a, a RNA as for your calibration. This, this would be even more accurate. So. It was, for me, it was, uh, I had to uh, decide or to, to say like, I've, I have to calibrate with one of, of those three in that sense. And I was then saying, okay, I use protein um, and measure everything then one time um, as, a, as a only measurement uh, to, to obtain these masses and to know, okay, what, what is the difference between the real value and, and the measured value? And uh, so I got this inaccuracies in that sense. But yeah, you this it's it's up to you what you use for for protein or for for calibration. Alrighty, and it looks like we have time for one more question, and it is: mm -hmm. Is the surface modification with poly polylysine easy to carry out? Yes, um, <clears throat> the the surface modification. I think it takes like. Or roughly one minute or something. It's it's not it's done very easily. So you um, have your prepared. I think it was one or ten percent polylysine um, solution. Um, but this is this is uh, this is always uh, according up to a protocol from refined. So um, it's just you add a drop of on on one of your slides and then you just put two slides together like like a cross um, and then you have in the middle your your polylysine and then you just uh, dry it and then just um, dip it into water one time to to wash out excess of, or excess um, polylysine and then it, that's it. So it's it's very easy, very convenient and um, yeah. So in that sense, it's 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 good, <laughs> good and easy. Thank you, Sagar. Do you have any final comments for our audience? um yeah use use mass photometry in that sense uh, i'm uh, in the beginning i was also a bit um yeah okay how how this is all working but it's it's easy it's um and what i really like is that you don't need any labels like fluorescent labels or spin labels or whatsoever and you can easily get the purify purity of your uh, solutions and um equilibria and how does it really look in in uh in your solution uh sometimes you don't know it and this was also for me the the information were very very important for my uh, single molecule experiments which i uh, employed uh up on the information i obtained via mass photometry 
Wonderful. Thank you again, Zagar, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Refine, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.